So hello, everyone. How is everyone doing today that is uh, connected to us today? Um, this session is, um, we are talking about the future of, uh, of uh, butchery and, um, and creating the parody um, so that we can create a much more level playing field for all that are, um, all that are connected and all that are involved. So I have some amazing panelists that are on here today. We have uh, Dr. Michelle Finstel, Kama Davis, John Jackson, and Keisha Cameron from High Hog Farm. And um, I would like each of you to take you know, just a few minutes to uh, to actually tell us about, you know, your sense of place, where you are currently, um, what your farm, ranch, projects, um, any of the things that you are connected to that has to do with, uh, with good meat. So uh, we'll start off with uh, ladies first, John. Ladies <laughs> first, okay? <laughs> so, da can talk to us about uh, what, you, what you're up to and where you are. All right, hello everybody. I'm Dr. Michelle Fannensteel. I'm the CEO of Durgo Food Safety and uh, I run uh, two projects that are of interest right here and they are Food Safety University, which you can go find at foodsafetyuniversity.com. And then the other thing that I do is we build systems, uh, we build facilities to do on farm slaughter and processing and so that's what i am up to because i do that work i am knee deep as it were in the conversation about agriculture and how we get good meat into the hands of consumers and where the hiccups and hang-ups are and my business is dedicated to solving those uh, solving this some of those like block and tackle facility problems that we have there's just like not enough infrastructure to get done what we all want to get done awesome 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 well uh i can't wait to hear more about it as we're into this conversation so can talk to us kama davis Hi, uh, I'm Camus Davis, and I'm the executive director. That's okay. It's a hard name. Um, I, I'm the executive director of the Good Meat Project, which is a nonprofit um, based here in Portland, Oregon, but we work nationally and internationally. Um, our mission is to build pathways toward responsible meat production and consumption. Um, we, uh, the, our definition of good meat changes constantly, but we see good meat, quote unquote, as a constellation of practices that are working towards responsible meat production and, and consumption, consumption. So that includes stewardship of land, animals, and people in some way, shape, or form. Um, it includes transparency, ideally from start to finish. And it also provides uh, space for some form of community and some form of joy. Um, and we, uh, we focus mainly on knowledge and skill sharing in most of our programs. Um, our, we do a lot of workshops, except for in the, in the pandemic, um, but we do a lot of workshops uh, for consumers, for produce, meat, good meat producers, and for food professionals um, that focus on the demand side of getting meat to people's tables. Um, so teaching people about humane slaughter, about whole animal butchery and whole animal utilization, um, but for the perspectives of consumers versus producers versus pr food professionals. So it changes depending. We also um, are focused a little bit on research. So we have a program called the Good Meat Atlas where we're um, working with uh, good meat practitioners around the world um, to sort of help uh, to, to find out how they are preserving certain good meat traditions and how they're carrying them on and helping those folks tell, tell those stories to a wider population. And then today I'll probably be talking mostly about a new project that we're working on um, called the Good Meat Breakdown, which is a collaborative project with a bunch of other organizations that is about knowledge sharing and information sharing for consumers who are looking to buy good meat, but who are rather confused by the somewhat janky landscape of getting good meat to our tables. Um, and as well serves as a, a resource for good meat producers 
who have to spend a lot of time educating consumers and um, talking to consumers about how it all how it all works. Um, so I'll probably be focusing on that today. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I like that word janky that you used um, because it is very much so a janky system right about now. Um, Keisha Cameron from High Hog Farm. Um, what you got going on? Oh, you know, we always have a little bit of everything going on around here, but um, it's nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation to take part. Uh, I'm Keisha Cameron, High Hog Farm, just here outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And um, our focus around meat has been a little bit smaller, more intimate. Um, we are a fiber farm primarily, but it has been a journey to that point. And three, two years ago, we started a chicken and poultry improvement program um, after having raised broilers on the farm and we farm with our family. So it's myself, my husband and my three boys. And we weren't thrilled with some of the ways in which we, we were raising broilers and ordering broilers. So we have um, tying into that a focus with heritage breeds of livestock and our sheep and our rabbits are also heritage breeds. Oftentimes in our case, they're dual purpose breeds. So we've had to learn or are in the process of learning to not only develop what we're calling good meat, but also how do we make sure that that meat is prepared in a way that's good for the table. Um, and there's just been some challenges with, you know, outside of ourselves with getting access to processors. I mean, this past year has really kind of highlighted the need um, for more local processing or um, USDA backed processing facilities so that we're not having to haul birds out of state. Um, and then lastly, my, my son who is the chef or the future chef <laughs> um, has started smoking the bacon and um, preparing the food and uh, is not squeamish at all when it comes to you know butchery and it, it occurred to me that that was a need that we should address and kind of promote so part of our focus is not only just being able to you know process our birds on farm or any of the meat um, taking it to the processor and making sure that we have, um, I don't know if the technical term is slabs, but we can do our own custom cuts from the processor after we get it back. But as a learning opportunity for him with the lamb as well as the, the chickens. And then I taste test that I'm quality control. That's my focus. Oh, awesome. Um, awesome, yeah. awesome. I love it. <laughs> it's multi, it's multi-layered at this point, but really recognizing that need. And uh, I think the, the water's edge for him was um, my attending a field dressing and quartering of a deer um, class, which I think I posted pictures, yes, of, of me. I was, I was elbow deep and it was really, really rewarding. And we actually learned how to use all parts of the, I mean, all parts of the deer. And that's another area of just wild game. But having that knowledge so that we can feed ourselves and sustain ourselves is, is important. So Definitely, definitely. Awesome. Well, last but definitely not least, John Jackson of Stag Vets um, and Comfort Farms. Talk to us. Hey, thanks for having me here, guys. I appreciate it. My name is John Jackson, the executive director of Stag Vets and the founder of Comfort Farms. And... Um, one of the things I, uh, I, I focus on primarily is the uh, behavioral health of using the farming landscape or the agricultural landscape to help returning veterans uh, who are transitioning. And not only to help them, but to help their families to adjust. Um, a lot of us veterans, when we come back from war, the biggest thing is we're sitting in four walls with our therapists and they want us to tell war stories. And then you go back and there's a new therapist there and then a new therapist there and you're telling the same old stories all the time. And then you're just done with it, you know? 
And so um, I had the gall to tell the VA to say, hey, you know, you guys do what you do. I'm going to go start the farm, uh, something that I did not know anything about. Uh, so <laughs> when I started this nonprofit, um, it really was a way for me to uh, get to the land, uh, use the land as a way to, uh, to heal and, um, and also as my own uh, way to um, have the land absor absorb, you know, some of the traumas that um, I personally went through. So um, with that being said, um, we developed this thing called agrocognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and what it is, is the conditioning effect of using the land in the way, um, in the farm, in a way to help veterans get back to their new normal. Because it's very hard for a veteran to, or even any person of trauma, to go uh, to experience that trauma and become the person that they were before that trauma. And that's what therapy um, up till now has been. And so we're not funded by any, um, you know, uh, federal grants to, uh, for the agro cognitive behavioral therapy. We're not, um, it's not, we hardly get uh, any of, you know, uh, sponsorships uh, or corporate sponsorships to keep going. So the most unique thing about our nonprofit is that I had to create a robust agribusiness. And um, what the agribusiness does uh, on the farm is it supports the farm in its efforts for its mission. So we farm for a purpose. Um, with that being said, I've had to really narrow down my field of focus on what type of animals to grow, what type of crops to grow, how am I gonna market those type of things. And what I discovered is that at the end of the day, people want to be closer to their food source. And so we've created a really beautiful, magical place where people are connected to their food source. Prior to COVID as a small 20 acre farm uh, and with our partners, we were selling to approximately 50 restaurants in the state of Georgia. Um, we were hitting sales, we were doing things. Uh, COVID hit and literally um, in a 16 second conversation, we lost everything. We lost our ability to take care of ourselves. But within that 16 seconds, I decided that I was gonna pivot to the community, um, really kind of showcase our meats, do what we have to do. And literally in less than three weeks, we recouped all of our losses plus three. COVID has been bad for us, but it's also been really good for us in the sense that it has awakened um, people's spirits on getting connected to their food, learning about how to process their foods. Um, we have a documentary that's coming out uh, actually today. Uh, it's called the Comfort Farms documentary. It's on Prime, um, Amazon Prime. It's on all the networks, iTunes. So check it out if you're looking to um, see what, you know, see what we're actually doing. We've recently been awarded a NIFA grant for the next three years called Ag Tech to Success. And part of this is what I see as we have to help develop the workforce for the next generations. And, and what I mean by help, we need to create people or help develop people in this landscape that are going to uh, take farming seriously, um, you know, whole animal care in a way that is very productive, um, intense, and also regenerative. Um, you don't see that right now in a lot of uh, universities and colleges. So it's one of the things that, that we are starting and that starts in January. Okay. But my main thing is whether we're um, growing animals to slaughter, to working with chefs, is to really show the reverence of those animals. Those animals have lives. Our corporate, our corporate structure really takes the reverence out of uh, what we as farmers do by mass slaughter, mass kill. And one of the things that um, as a veteran, um, you can really understand how life is cheap. And so we really wanna give back to the land, give back to our animals and make sure that even when we do take the lives of those animals humanely, that is something to be remembered. You should feel emotion when you are, are partaking of a life or have to take a life to sustain yourself. Um, I tell people that um, if you can't do that, eat more vegetables. Um, and if you are going to spend money on meat, make sure it's the best meat that came from farmers that really care about their animals, about their livestock, because uh, we owe it to them and, um, and we owe it to the land that, that we work on. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, what a great group of people that we have here. Um, I see a couple of questions that have come across and, and we're going to try our best to uh, cover some of these. Um, 
One of them is about access and affordability uh, working together. Um, and I noticed, John, when you talked about pivoting towards the community, um, it's really been interesting. C-19 has, has opened up a lot of, uh, a lot of, like you said, it, there's been some really bad things that have happened, but it's also some really good things that have really been pushed. And one of the things that I've been able to see here in Brunswick, Georgia, is something very similar where we have a, a spot called Way Green Market. And um, they went from a once a month market to a every weekend pickup to now they have drop off points within a 50 mile radius, they have drop off points now. Um, those things even happened if all of this thing, all of these things didn't happen. So I think um, to your point, um, it's, it's not just looking for the silver lining, it's actually creating the silver lining. And so that is what we wanna talk about um, today is how we, how we can come closer to, uh, to closing up that gap. Now, one of the things that I've been able to see is over the last, uh, over, over this last year is understanding the history of butchery and how long, I mean, it's, it's a super old profession, right? It's, it's been going on forever. Um, and then the more uh, we were able to domesticate animals and all of that kind of good stuff, it allowed us to, uh, to now coalesce and, 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 and eat the way we want to eat, you know, and it's what's really been interesting is when I started to think about how uh, I, Thomas, when you said, you know, the movement of good meat, the naming of it, you know, kind of the definition of it, you know, seems to kind of have a, a kind of like a sliding thing, you know, it moves to this and it becomes that. But I've really noticed that locally, where folks are coming together to realize that they actually don't have to buy just what's there in the grocery store, that it, that it literally is plenty of people that are uh, that are doing meat locally um, to be able to feed folks. And it's, uh, it's one of those interesting things uh, where people try to figure out, you know, can small farmers feed the whole world? No, we can't feed the whole world. That's, it's done. But we can feed our community. And I think that we have to really start focusing in on the community as, as where all of this is going to be coming from. So, one of the things that we're talking about also is the parity, right? Is how do we create uh, the system so that we can close this gap a little bit? So one of the questions I have, and I'm gonna start off with you, Doc, and starting off with you is because you talk a lot about systems. And when you talk about systems and how they work and what needs to be done, I really, I really, have always enjoyed our conversations about that. So if you could talk, if you could possibly talk about the gaps that you see currently um, in the meat realm, and then how you are engaging, not just your community, but what you're looking at to help other communities be able to close up the gap. Sure. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the gaps that we see is in, um, Reference is 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 echoed in the food justice movement, right? There are, if we look at access to funding, there is a huge, huge gap, lawsuits notwithstanding, between how minority farmers and ranchers are funded and the mechanisms with funding uh, that allows um, that allows either um, historically landowning families like yours, Matthew, or new landowning families to get access to the funding to create the infrastructure to get out there and do the marketing and 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 look and and really create um, the possibility for access. So I asked this question about access and affordability because it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. And that's the problem with the system, that the system as we look at it is working as designed, but the system is, that works as designed is the system that primarily um, um, is written by and for white farming and ranching communities. And they're the ones that have access to the, um, to the money um, and access. Not a, and it's not just the money, it's to the, the levers and wheels of power. And so if we look at where 
you know, USDA programs come into play, um, like the BFRDP, the Beginning Farmer and Ranchers uh, um, uh, grants and value-added producer grants and things like that, they, by and large, uh, create more opportunity for those who already have opportunity. And the question is then, how do we, how do we bridge those gaps and how do we take this idea that do, of, of frankly doing what John is doing, which is creating a farm that actually makes money and it addresses a consumer need. And what does the system look like so that we can allow the people who are in the community to be responsive to their community? Because I have tons of people who are like, Dr. P, I want to start a slaughterhouse. I'm like, great. I can start a slaughterhouse with you for under $2 million. That is still a a huge level of capital for many, many, many people. And the question is, is how are you gonna, how are you gonna like move animals through that infrastructure and where can we start so that you can, you can maybe start with game processing, right? That like Keisha was talking about in a way that you could actually make money, money at it. And I think that there is a, um, that when we look at a system, we always start with what results are we trying to create? I can create any system if we look at and are committed to what results we are trying to create. And the result that I am trying to create in local and sustainable agriculture is profitability and the ability to take a vacation. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Those vacation. are my metrics. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking my language. <laughs> What's that? Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm, I, I appreciate hearing that out loud. Um, so I'm gonna jump over to you, Keisha. Um, how are you all closing that gap with a, a fa you know, running a family run farm? I, I, I like the fact that, um, that the family is hugely involved in everything. Um, I've had uh, the honor and privilege to uh, be out at your farm and uh, and watch the family put things together. But how how are you how are you seeing the community either you getting to the community or the community coming to you um, with with everything? Yeah. Um, and again, I'm I'm nodding and. I, I was, I need to catch my breath for a moment because the idea of a vacation just sounds so nice that I kind of had to regroup, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a little different because how we came to farming and how we operate our farm or our vision for farming is slower and smaller um, and out of necessity as a peri-urban farm, you know, there's, if as being a steward of the land, we have to be mindful of what we ask of the land. So when we are thinking about our stocking rate, we keep our stocking rate smaller and just we work from a place where we're, we can be sure we're going to be sustainable and more regre regenerative. So the profitability piece, that is a gap. <laughs> um, finding, striking that balance between um, what we can get from an animal off, off the hoof versus how many value added, which then opens up the possibilities, but then time becomes a factor. And the <clears throat> levers and mechanisms that um, Michelle mentioned where you just have the, the, the infrastructure in place and you have the facilities to do a lot of the things that we wanna do. So um, that's the first, I think, gap for us. I see, the, I see it on a larger scale. And I know that what we do, especially you know, with conversations around what do black farmers need, what we do does not address the larger systemic and societal, you know, um, the policies and solutions that need to be in place for land access and for the, the big picture for um, agriculture within its current context. But my argument has always been, as we address, and, and I'll try to highlight the two parts of this, but starting somewhere with the small farmer, like you've mentioned, having the idea that if you can be a feed your community, if you can feed your family, and then you can feed your community, 
that's a start. It doesn't address the bigger issues, but it does put you in a position where you have begun to raise awareness, create points of access. Um, I think this year really highlighted the way that the larger system we say is broken, but was designed and functioning or functioning the way it was designed. And yet there were small, they're plowing in, you know, fields and crops and there's all this meat that's being going to waste and animals being slaughtered, but there's lines of people waiting um, to get food and food to um, food pantry lines. And you've got small farmers who can't get into processors. So there's a number of gaps. And what I see my responsibility for as a steward and as um, just a, a mom with family and friends is to educate, not only to create access. So my solution is we do things that seem as simple as you know canning, cooking. Um, when we do our chickens, we, we know what our capacity is. And I automatically say 26 birds from each batch go into my freezer and then the rest are sold to everyone else. And that's because I have a chicken for a week for six months. And I can teach people how to make one bird. I got that from my grandma. I can make a bird last for a week now. Look, if you give me, we gonna eat all right. So <laughs> that is one that. aspect that I think has helped is mm -hmm. just teaching people how to put, put up food. And then, you know, we have a Dexter that's actually at a friend's farm right now because she has an overabundance of pasture. Isn't that a nice problem? Um, <laughs> and the processing date was postponed until the following year, but having to educate people around how to cook and prepare grass-fed beef so that it's a little bit different, but that education piece is important. Um, and then another thing, we raise rabbits, uh, heritage breed rabbits, and I have older generation folks who want to ask for rabbits. The younger generation doesn't eat them, but rabbits have been hugely beneficial for us as farmers in terms of how to rebuild the health of our pastures, how to be small enough to where they fit the right, the right size scale for our size operation. So those are things where I think just the small part that we can do to address some of those gaps are around access and education are really important as we move towards addressing the larger the issues and just really cautioning people not to throw the baby out with the bath water as we try to, you know, bite the, swallow the whole elephant in one bite. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, I'm glad you brought up rabbits because that comes to my man, John Jackson, mm -hmm. and you do something really interesting with your rabbit waste. Um, yeah. Can you, can you talk uh, a little bit about that? Because, you know, I, I think each one of you um, are actually adding to the next person's conversation because, I mean, we, we talk about systems, now we're talking about family and putting up things. And now, I've, I mean, I think creating that education and, and doing the parody, right, absolutely, Keisha's full circle. So can you talk about what you do with the um, that you have, uh, John? Yes, um, so our rabbit operation, uh, besides being a, a great operation for uh, food and providing food to our communities and chefs, um, the most, the best thing for us is the actual rabbit waste. And um, one of the things that we do with our rabbit waste is uh, create a rabbit manure tea. And so with that tea, um, I pretty much a five gallon bucket uh, it it kind of works in this metrics where there's a five gallon bucket for a 55 gallon drum. Um, I go ahead and just like tea, I steep that rabbit uh, manure um, in the water and I let it sit for a couple of days until it uh, to kind of you know engage those microbes. Uh, once those microbes are engaged, I go ahead and feed it just like you would with a uh, any type of kombucha or or if you if you're trying to make wine or beer, we go ahead and we pour. Um, some uh, molasses in there uh, for the bacteria that eat the sugars and you'll see it, it starts to activate. Um, mm -hmm. And with that, I'll add some, uh, some kelp uh, minerals to it, uh, all the essential minerals to that. And then we have 55 gallon 
drum of rabbit manure tea that we use to um, uh, use in our gardens. And that is a biodynamic way of farming. People ask me, they say, you know, are you organic? And I say, no, I'm better than organic because we literally um, take the inputs from our farm and use it back in. And it's a very cyclical, inclusive system on the farm that really all starts with the rabbits. Yeah. See, and, and, and that, and that, see, we're talking about closing the gap. Closing the gap is more this, Michelle, it's more than just the piece and finance, right? It's the system, like creating a system to where now, uh, and we have a question for you, Keisha, that you might want to answer. Somebody wants to know, how do you make a chicken last uh, a whole week? So, um, but being able to go full circle on everything that we do is like, highly important so that so that you're closing also the gap on money right because you don't have to buy uh any type of inputs you don't have to buy compost you don't have to there are things you don't have to buy which means that you can uh possibly save money to do other things with so that part being said Thomas, with a good meat project and all of the information that you have on that site I am, I, I was honored to, to, to be one of the people to see it from the very, very beginning um, uh, before you uh, hit the button for the world to see. Can you talk about what that site offers uh, the community as a whole? Uh, yeah, so one of the gaps that we have seen at the Good Meat Project is, um, We've seen that meat producers who are working largely outside of the industrial model, obviously y'all face so many challenges. Um, it's a full-time job to raise the meat. It's a full-time job to sell the meat. It's a full-time job to educate consumers about why it costs so much, why there's good meat and why there's bad meat. I mean, there's just so much that one producer has to do. And um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we really saw uh, we, we watched a lot of producers um, having to shift to, to, to different models, different sales models, having to suddenly losing their wholesale accounts and having to set up online sales platforms or, or selling directly to consumers for the first time. And we also saw um, an increase in consumers who, are, who, who saw the empty grocery store, store shelves and were wanting to um, suddenly realized, oh, there are some farmers around me that I could buy some meat from, and but really had sort of no access, no, no understanding of what that meant, how you buy it, how you, how you access that. And so um, the Good Meat Project, my, myself and a few other people were, happened to be on a call with a bunch of other um, organizations kind of working in this space early on in the pandemic. And we, we said to ourselves, like, A, all of these producers are working, are going it alone. They're working alone. Um, they're having to reinvent the social media wheel, the marketing wheel, the education wheel. It's hard. It's a lot of work to try and do direct sales to consumers all on your own. And at the same time, we saw consumers saying like, I don't, what's grass fed? Like, what does it mean to buy a whole cow? How, like, what's the difference between organic meat and, you know, regenerative meat? So we decided to fill the space um, by building an online resource called the Good Meat Breakdown. You can see it right now if you go online, it's called the goodmeatbreakdown.org. Um, that A, helps consumers figure out how to find good meat in their regions, um, helps them understand all the different ways they can buy it, and helps them understand how to cook it to, to Keisha's point. Um, how do you, you know, if you're buying a half cow from someone, how, how in the heck do you use all of that meat? What do you, how do you, how do you buy it? And we, and we know, I mean, having myself, having done butchery workshops for consumers for a long time, um, you know, I, I've seen how little not, that, that part of the equation is, is not accessible to most of us, most consumers, not even a lot of producers. Um, and I've seen how butchery classes can inspire consumers to start asking more questions, start digging, start looking for producers in the region. But we also know that not everyone has time for that. And so the Good Meat Breakdown is an attempt to say, to meet consumers where they are at and say, you know, here are all the different ways that you can access good meat. If you're just going to go to the grocery store, like here's what you're facing. If you're going to the farmer's market, here are the choices that you have. If you're buying a share of meat from 
uh, Keisha or John, here, here's what you're gonna have to know in terms of cut sheets and freezer space and all of that stuff. And the larger goal, and this gets back to, to creating parity and sort of closing that gap is that we have one resource that all of these good meat producers that are working alone can refer their customers to so that they're not having to spend all this time doing all of that education themselves. And in addition, we can start to think about how do all of these good meat producers, how can we, how can we grow under one big umbrella? How can, we, how can we show consumers that there's this constellation of good meat practices that we all fit under and we're all working towards the same goals and start to share memes, messaging, language, photos, images, all of that stuff so that we can create a, a, a resource base for all of us working in that, in that sphere to draw from. And I'll end with, you know, I learned butchery from a family of pig farmers in France who were vertically integrated. They cooperatively owned a slaughterhouse with other farmers. They, um, you know, it was four brothers, two other wives. I mean, they worked, they worked together and they worked with their community. And the, my mentor would always say at the beginning of the day, and I'm not gonna say it in French because I will butcher it. Um, you work alone, you die. <laughs> it was very, it was very dramatic, mm -hmm. but it was true. And so this is our small attempt to try and say, okay, let's build some resources together. Let's build some messaging together. Awesome. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, when we first uh, all were on, you know, uh, comments, you, you made the comment, like, can we all just get together and just talk? You know, can we all just, you know, can we, can we just be the ones that talk? And one of the things that I would, encourage all 104 people that are watching this is that you figure out your tribe and you don't stop talking to them you got and, and that your tribe needs to be bigger than you and i really like the point that you said if you work alone you die and so cooperative economics has always been the key for like magical success in communities and i think that Looking at that, um, looking at what you all have just created, um, Thomas, as kind of a resource um, to go to, I think is, is going to be like super critical. Um, I would like everyone to give us just one resource um, that you would suggest to use or suggest any of uh, our viewers to, to, to use to help them get their, whether it's their butchery skills up or connect locally or whatever. So everybody has one minute to say, or say one thing, anybody can start. I'm not gonna say who, who's gonna start. Well, I'll start uh, just to get it going. And then we got to do QA. Um, but I would like uh, everybody to invite everybody to my podcast. I podcast at foodsafetyuniversity.com. And I'm almost the only podcaster out there that talks not like on, on how to bring the systems of profitability and food safety together. Because without food safety, y'all, we can't actually provide anything. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Who's next? One resource. I'll go. Okay. Uh, one of the things that the Good Meat Project does is to incubate meat collectives. Um, the idea behind a meat collective is that uh, an individual or individuals in a community um, create a meat collective which offers classes in humane slaughter, whole animal butchery and whole animal utilization to community members. They source meat from local far good meat farmers. They hire butchers and chefs who know how to butcher to teach the classes. And then consumers come get to pick up knives break down sides of pigs or whole, learn how to turn a whole duck into five meals um, and then go home with that meat. And there are about 12, 12 in, the, in the United States. We're trying to incubate more. Um, you can go to the Good Meat Project website and find out um, where those exist. Okay, awesome. Uh, John and Keisha, do, you, do either one of you have I uh, do. A, a quick resource because I'm rolling down the five minutes for Q&A. Sorry. So uh, mine's super simple and it's, I'm going to share the introduction that I got, which is the Scott Ray project on YouTube. Um, I, it's not as formal, but it is a great introduction. If you want to see how your cuts are broken down and meat is broken down um, and what you can do yourself. So. Okay. How about you, John? Uh, we hold uh, what we call the Lea Piedmont Boucherie in, um, here in Georgia. It's a great way if you are 
um, in the States, if you could travel, obviously we're going to be paying attention to, um, you know, COVID restrictions and put some measures in place, but it is a full immersive program here in January on putting the butchers with the farmers and the chefs together to actually see humane slaughter. How do you break down how these animals are utilized in the reverence? So if you have a chance to, to uh, come check out Georgia Boucherie Festivals for tickets, that's going to be um, uh, in Georgia on in January 15th, 16th, and 17th. Um, we will, I mean, it's a, it's a life-changing event. Awesome. 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 So um, a couple of questions that have come up uh, that, that I've been able to see. So I'm going to go straight to the Q and a really quick. And um, one is what's the benefits of rabbits on pasture? I think that'd be you Keisha. Okay, um, similarly to what John, I don't go as far as putting the manure directly through a, a compost tea system, but rabbit manure is one of the only cold manures, meaning that it's green and can go directly back into your soil. So it is a way of not burning your plants or your crops and adding fertilization as we move them. We do actually have some of our Angora rabbits, which are not our meat rabbits, but our fiber rabbits, where we collect the manure and we do a vermicomposting system, which then is later spread across pastures. Okay, um, nice, nice. Uh, the next question was, how can we reserve the trend of meat processing consolidation and create more space um, in small local community processes? I think you mentioned some of this, uh, Thomas, in your... Uh, in your conversation about a, a meat collective, I think you, you said, can you add to that, please? Uh, well, meat collectives are not going to solve the problem of small local community processing. Um, so those are more, that, that's more a, an avenue for, for um, creating more demand amongst consumers and helping consumers to sort of feel like more active agents in, in the processes that get meat to their table. Um, I mean, the question of the trend of meat processing consolidation and, and how do we create more space for small local community processors, processors is a huge question. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where to start, honestly, um, except that it's at a, it's a policy level. I mean, it's a legislation yeah. level. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. absolutely. it starts there. And I, I will say that the pandemic has inspired many states that I can think of to start working towards um, more viable uh, legis legislation that allows for small processors to even exist. But man, I, that's like the tip of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg, right. Yeah, right. right. I would, so, if I um, could just add on okay. to that, because there are a couple of questions on that, on how do we get more local meat available without going through all the custom exemption and things like that. And I think that there is, um, there is, there is a level of conversation that we need to have um, that is less adversarial. <laughs> You know, um, the the more the more farmers stop approaching their meat and poultry inspection as the enemy, and the more um, the more we can bring those people into our conversation, right? You know, I mean, right before we started, I was talking with John about bringing uh, food animal vets to the boucherie, right? Because we can't have we can't have this conversation if I'm the only food safety vet having the conversation. It just does it doesn't work that way, and so we need people. Who are, who are willing to engage in those political conversations and to tolerate the discomfort of people who disagree with us and, and people who work for government who have different public health goals in mind than maybe some of us have when it comes to local meat. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this has to do with us not stopping the conversation. And I am hoping that everyone that has been connected on here will stay connected. Um, there's there was 104 of you. Um, hopefully uh, you downloaded the app and are looking for names and people that are there that you can connect with that might even be in your same state. Um, I really do appreciate all of you all's time. Um, I am looking forward to us all gathering again. Hopefully we can all get to the Lapide, the Boucherie. Um, so, I mean, that is in January. So that's like a month away. So let's... Uh, Let's look at maybe we, we all getting there and, uh, and hanging out for a second. I do wanna thank everybody um, that has been able to come on um, and please continue to enjoy the conference.
Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care.